Right, my name is Jason McGuinness. Um, I work in the city, uh, have for many years. I have a certain style of giving presentations, which involves wandering around and waving my hands. Um, yes, I really hate get shaz, because they don't canonically increase. So when you have them ordered in your file system listed by alphabetic, the last one is not the last one. Annoying. Anyway, uh, here we are, Accu, Bristol. There's my email address if you want to get in touch with me and query this afterwards. Uh, right, template better state machines, Madness, Shannon. What is this insanity I hear you speak? Wonder. Right, okay. Uh, this is quite complicated. And there's a lot of things to put in. So I apologize if the slides get a bit confusing. Uh, it is latex. LaTeX Beamer that I'm using, and I only recently discovered, because I'm fairly slow, that there is indeed a uh, code style for it, which I haven't used, which uh, doesn't help. Anyway, uh, I'll try and guide you through this adventure of madness. What happened is I decided uh, I've got a template meta state machine. What's this all about? Well, I'm going to then go through some methodology to try and justify what the heck I'm doing. And then we're going to have some Reflections on this thing called computed go-to, right? What is a computed go-to? Go-to considered evil, blah, blah. Yes. Uh, oh, by the way, word of warning. I do pray you've run Valgrind before. Remember, premature optimization is the root of all evil, and this is definitely in the area of premature optimization. So be warned. Do have, make sure you've run your Valgrind, private profiler, etc. You know, 90% of your, 10% of your code takes 90% of the runtime, tra la la. Please. Um, then we're going to go through the, we, we'll need some components involved with this. And I'll take you on a little adventure in template metaprogramming. And um, you'll probably wish I hadn't at the end. And then we've got this thing called a hash. And what the hash is it all about? And you might even think the hash is uh, something to do with uh, a big mess. And there's a curious ambiguity in English there. Then we're going to have some results. And I'm going to look at the methodology of the results to try. This is in a, I'm phrasing this in the sense of an experiment. And, you know, we've got, you know, method, results, conclusion, as you can see. And then we'll have some conclusions. And then we'll have this epilogue -y thingy. Because there'll be a little end note, which is quite fun. Um, righty, righty. Uh, more tea, Vicar. Okay. So what's this computed go-to malarkey? We've got this very simple piece of code. I can't quite reach up there. So I'll have to uh, use uh, something more efficient. When you have a short... See, go-to, consider... Right, what's this interesting about this? I know it's a call, so there's a return. But I like stack frames. They're a really good idea. You've probably heard me talk about that and rant about it. But anyway, well, it's a kind of computed go-to, you know what I mean? Basically, it's also how VFTs are implemented as well. Um, so what we've got is we've got a base, stride, and state. Now, I've already slipped into state because uh, I'd like to specify this and not be over general because it's already a bit tricky. And the state is like a new order message. It's the type. It's the a thing, the identifier. So we've got a branch target, and the branch target of this is a transition, because we're talking about meta state machines here. Heart of the state machine. You could also generate it in a naive if-else chain, if you wanted to. But given that I'm a micro-optimizer, and I work in HFT, I really don't like branches, because my branch target buffer with 32 slots is a precious resource, like a little flower. You need to nurture it and care for it and let it be used for the stuff that's truly important, i.e. the stuff I don't know about that I didn't optimize, and uh, I'm going to work hard at that. So, uh, the instruction timings for computed go-tos is excellent. Well, it depends, actually. You've got to watch out for the evil AGI monster. What is the AGI? Back in the day, the old Pentium 2s and Pentium 1s had what was called an address generation interlock where when you wanted to compute this, that's a multiply, that's an amp. You get some strength re reduction there if you're lucky. But the problem is, is that takes the pipeline, and you've got about 20 clock cycle stall. But nowadays, in modern processors, it's much better, and they've actually got special units that compute this in instruction fetch stage. 
because they decode the call and they go, well, hey, you need one of those, do you? And uh, the um, good old Intel and the rest, they, they stick in those adders and multipliers and they run really hot. Um, we'll see more. So you can get it in one to two clock cycles versus if we get a misprediction, roughly order 20, there's roughly 20 stages in the pipeline. So, um, okie dokie, we've got some motivation as to why we're interested in this computer go to. We're going to leave aside the computation of the base and the stride for the moment, because they're relatively easy to compute. You can see some template metaprogramming is beginning to smell in the air, like a rotten thingy. Um, the state may be more complex, because it is effectively random, it's runtime. I don't know the messages being sent to me. These naughty traders, you know, sometimes they want to make place a new order and then inconveniently cancel it randomly. Um, so if we want to make the state turn into something that's regular, not random, we're going to need to hash it. But there's a problem. Mr. Shannon. There ain't no such thing as a perfect minimal hash, a general perfect minimal hash. And we'll, um, but despite that, we're going to persevere because we're, well, I'm stubborn, very, very stubborn. And I like to bang my head against a wall. That's why I use C++ for so long. Right, so my problem statement is this. We shall generate computed go-tos. Two, no amount of effort shall be sacrificed to attain point one above. Obviously, there's the implicit three here, go to one. And that wasn't computed. So, my methodology. What we need to do is identify a suitable code base. Now, I chose this thing called a fixed MIT translator. For those of you who are less familiar with these terms, fix is an appalling message protocol uh, that's basically an ASCII, and it's a Name value pairs, it's of arbitrary length, the doubles in them don't round trip. Yes, it's rubbish. But it's used a lot, it's a de facto standard. MIT, uh, Millennium IT Protocol, uh, the LSC, Borsa Italia, many exchanges in the world uh, ran on that protocol, but although apparently they're changing soon. Anyway, I previously presented on these, so you can have a look at my other slides in due course. There are many references at the end. Um, so I'm going to modify that code base because I'm familiar with it, and I'm going to do compare. I'm going to attempt to create computed go-tos versus a naive, if else, implemented meta-state machine. I want to make sure my results are statistically significant. It's very important. None of this, oh, I measured it once, and it took n. n what? Seconds. Yeah, great. What's your error? Was your computer quiescent? Yeah? That one number is useless. All it demonstrates is you don't know how to measure. There will be ramifications of using computed go-to. Oh, yes. I like histograms. Why? Because if I give you a number, let's call it four microseconds, plus or minus 2% mean average deviation, this is basically a summary of what the histogram is and we really want to see the histogram. So yes, I do lots of histograms. We'll see a few here. Um, I'm going to have a subjective review of the code that I created, and I shall prevent, present it before you, and you will probably uh, think about it and go, hmm, hmm. And then we're going to, as I said, make some conclusions. By the way, not summary, because if I give you a summary, why go through the rest of the talk? The talk is, by definition, a summary of the work I did. Uh, it's recursive. And then the summary of the summary is 42. So, I have a trading system, this fixed MIT translator. It's a basically a very mini, 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 the most minuscule trading system you could possibly get, um, mainly because I wrote it in my spare time, because uh, I got bored of writing these things. So, what I do is you get messages sent from a client to an exchange. There's a state machine there, bingo, because I've got new message, cancel, replace, blah, 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 log on, log off, etc. Right, and we've also got messages sent back from the exchange to the client, obviously including state machines. We've got plenty there to work with. Good. They're on the hot path. Good, good, good. You know, remember, I've decided not to profile my code. Right? I've decided, why is it there? Why am I doing this? Because the mountain is there. Why did I climb it? Because it was amused me. 
I've looked at low latency optimizations in this and um, it kind of motivated me into looking at trying to write the fastest metastate machine I possibly could. In other words, there would be no statistically significant difference between the changes in the code. I've got to what one might say is the noise floor. Why, oh why? Why, what is it? It's simply the adventure. I decided, that looks pretty. Let's walk over there and smell the flowers. Why not? So, we have some motivation, we have justification. Good, beware. As I said, optimize your code first. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. This talk verges on that. In fact, certainly verges. That's actually possibly a contradiction. Because certainly verges, surely it's just certainly or doesn't. But anyway, um, it's up to you to decide. Preferred profiler, heed Amdahl's law, the 90-10 law, 90% of your code, 10% of your code takes 90% of the runtime. Remember when you're parallelizing your code, if the parallel bit goes at infinite speed, then the speed of your code is entirely the speed of the sequential portion. It should be comprehensible, maintainable, compile reasonably quickly. Uh, I claim comprehensibility is lost, main, therefore maintainability is lost. Compiling reasonably quickly is definitely lost. If we listen carefully, do you hear that faint humming noise? Yeah. That's my lap break. Yes, as I said, I shall not repeat myself there. You can read. Okie dokie. So, we're going to come up with, I need my longer, more puissant pointer. Right, constrained override type. You're going to start seeing sort of codey thingies here. Um, the target address is all that is known about the destination of the object. If I do a go to, what do I know about the type of the thing I'm going to? It's bits. It's go to, it's a jump address, it's assembler. I have no idea what I'm jumping into. The wilds. Specifically in this case, my state that comes in with a transition is going to call, cause a call to a jump of the related transition. I shall call it the, I shall have this magic function I call process, right? Uh, there's a good reason why I didn't use the operator overload, and I could have done the function call operator overload. I could have done, but it just made the code even more confusing. So I thought it's just better to give it a word that you can search for in your code base. Um, I want to do it in a generic manner. Because obviously, you know, flexibility and all that. I'm a, you know, programmer, library writer. Let's, let's, you know, generosity is good. It's an index operation, effectively, into a collection of transitions. My collection of transitions is, shall we say, an array of these transitions that somehow I index into in some kind of hand-waving sense. Notice the waving of the hands. Um, we'll generalize it a bit by generating some wrappers using this constrained override type. The types of the parameters to the process function will have to be recovered. Because I've worked very hard to erase that type in the computed go-to. But of course, I'm C++, I want type safety, surely. Yes, and process may be overloaded. You may have a transition which has one sort of process, another one with another sort of process. Let me give you a very simple example. I send messages from the client to the exchange. By definition, I'm connected to the exchange. By definition, I have a client. Yes, but if I get messages from the exchange back to the client, what happens if the client crashed? Or the client isn't there, or hasn't... Woo-woo happens. Yes, I may have a second overload to process which takes a wrapper to the client method because it may not simply have a connected. It may have gone away. So I need to do something with those messages. So I've got two overloads to process. And how do I do that when I've erased all the type? Right, okay, um, this metastate machine, it's based on, upon the boost metastate machine from many years ago. The boost metastate machine has guards and all kinds of other funky stuff. I simply didn't need that, so I stripped it out. I wish to make it a little bit more comprehensible and also have to write a lot less code. Uh, this is all done in my spare time. Uh, again, why? It was there. 
So what we've got is we've got this collection of transitions into which the states shall index. So what is this collection? It is, I term it as unordered tuple. Naming is hard. Good naming is even harder. I claim these names are not good. It is up to others to decide. Uh, I was inspired by Vladimir Arnasht regarding an unordered tuple. It was quite a bit of a laugh, really. So this is, remember I said, I've waved my hands. We've got this constrained override type which somehow wraps the transition to make the process work. We'll look into that in detail in due course. Then we've got this collection of transitions, right? So this is the collection of transitions. And we call it unordered tuple. Why do we not use tuple? Because the big problem with tuple is get. Get open angle bracket zero. Compile time. I need it run time. This makes things a lot harder. OK. Devil is in the details. There's a dirty little secret here. A line has stride standard array of standard byte. Yeah, big array of stuff. Because I hate memory allocation. Remember, I am a micro-optimizer. And if I do a memory allocation, then that means I've got to jump to that address, which means I've got to fetch the address, dereference it, and call it. Oh, dear. I don't like that. That's clock cycles. Ooh. No, 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 no. So we go to placement new, the transitions into this on the stride appropriately aligned. So this is all good, 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 good. Now we've got the base in stride, and we can compute those at compile time because you can, because you've got the types coming in of the transitions, and therefore you know the re alignment requirements, etc. And we're going to supply a suitable index operator, because I like all the uh, special source that C++ gives you, and it, 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 it gives you this lovely little gloss that everything looks so simple because I just do index and call dot process and pass the parameters and it's all so lovely and wonderful you don't realize that the swan's busy paddling its legs really hard underneath. But we, these input states are effectively random numbers, which means my standard array of standard byte with the size in it is going to be very big. And that's very bad for my L1 cache, D cache which is only about 32 or 64 uh, k bytes in size. So I want to make it smaller. So therefore, I'm going to have to hash. Yes. Oh, my. Mm. Right, how are we doing? Oh, good. Time is good. Marvelous. Beware the angle brackets, my son, daughter, creature, thing. Um, much has been written on the pitfalls of template meta programming. Um, our esteemed Mr. Henny came up with Henny's hypothesis. For each additional template parameter, the potential number of users is halved. Yeah. Varadic templates, infinite number of template parameters, anybody? Rather small number of users now we're talking about, aren't we? Potentially. Um, template meta programming made easy by Martosh Mlieski. I can't pronounce his surname properly, I apologize. Um, forgive the, I copy this from his site. Big part of it is that C++ templates are rather ill-suited for metaprogramming, to put it mildly. Oh, yes, he's absolutely right. Uh, there are many sins in here along those lines. So those of you who are frightened of angle brackets, ouch. Okay. Uh, one of my reviewers, Vlad, said, yeah, you've told me all these types, and so now I'm just bleh. So he said, why can't you make a picture? And the first picture I came up with had uh, about 80 boxes in it and needed a screen about the entire wall. And this isn't long enough. Mm. More tea. Neurotransmitters, lovely. Right, OK. So I've been waving my hands about this. This is a schematic of how it all kind of goes together. I avoided UML because it wouldn't have fitted on the screen. Uh, I used what I term as technically blobs in space. See? Blob, see space. Right. So we've got this computed go-to metastate machine. OK, this is my big metastate machine, that boost MSM variant thing. Cool. It contains, see this box here? a state transition table. Well, states, plural, because there are a number of states, obviously, and it actually should have been states transitions table. Apologies, because there is more than one transition. So this is the unordered tuple that contains those. 
that provides the operator angle brackets using a perfect hash, assuming it can be generated, that has constrained override types, and then we're going to have lots of things that this constrained override type provides us. It's going to provide us some kind of abstract base type which contains process, because you can see that in order to call the target of computer go to, we're going to have to do some kind of inheritance. And we all go, ah, inheritance, multiple inheritance, and all that. Uh, no, uh, no multiple inheritance, because this is all single inheritance. All the types are known up front a priori. Sorry, a posteriori. Um, very important, that, actually. Now, each row, in a sense, of the constrained override type has a final concrete type. You can see final, yeah, we've, we were trying to get rid of that virtualization, uh, which will wrap the call to abstract base type process to try and recover that type information. The concrete type wraps a transition which contains, there is some intrusiveness, something called a type in there called signatures types. And that provides the override for the process and calls the contained transition process. What is this constraint, what is this magic wizardry I hear you squeal of? Uh, yes, what we need to do is, because we don't have reflection, I need these signatures types because what happens is when you provide your transition, your new order transition, you provide your process function. I have no reflection to try and recover that argument data, so I've got to have a using statement that gives me a tuple of those arguments, which I can then analyze using constrained override type and all these other things with a bit of template metaprogramming, a little bit. Right, now we have this concrete type. It inherits recursively, dot, 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 right? We've got rid of a load of boxes. Then we've got a terminal concrete type, which inherits from an ultimate abstract base type, and that contains all the pure virtual process methods. So now you can begin to see how that go-to works, because I've got a collection of pure virtual process methods. Right? And I've collected all those abstract base types together into the ultimate one, and then similarly to the concrete type, we provide the abstract base functions. We use the signatures types to provide a virtual process method. Notice the dots here. I'd be very, very careful to avoid seeing exactly the type of the arguments that are used there. Um, then what we're going to do is have the final one. Yeah, we inherit, sorry, we inherit recursively, blah, blah, blah. And then we have the final one, which inherits from an ultimate base type, which also provides, the final one also provides the final process method. Excellent. And now we have more rows, more of these. That's only one row. So if we look at this in terms of algorithmic complexity, I've got an order n here, I've got an order n there, they add together, so that's still order n, but then I've got another m here, so that's m by n. Yes, I do have polynomial time computation. Marvelous. Compile types are not going to look good here. But remember, we don't care. This is, we're going for the fastest possible. Remember the problem statement? I want to generate computed go-to. I don't care about anything else. So, unordered tuple. What is this magic wizardry I hear you wonder about? Right, we need a base class. We've got to call the overload. We need a base class. You know that abstract base type? Yep, that we compute. We need a hasher. We need some transitions. So, we can compute the maximum size, because these are all template parameters. Yeah. Size off, dot, dot, dot. We can compute a stride. Bingo. We can compute the stride also, because we align everything. The stride also gives me a line as of the array. And now we have our wrapped transitions. And here is a schematic of how the operator angle brackets works on an ordered tuple. When we call table angle brackets dot process, this gives you an idea of here's an incoming state, right? What we're going to do is get my base address, yeah? It doesn't actually work like this. It's, I've, I've simplified the code. And by the way, the code does not use these names either because it's much more generic. Because remember, a meta-state machine may not actually be handling things like uh, um, uh, 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 orders messages to an exchange. They might be doing something else. And therefore, that's why in the code that you'll see, that you may see online if you're mad enough to try and have a look at it, uh, you'll see different names are used. But also, uh, when I wrote the code, naming is hard. And I changed my mind when I did it here to try and make it more simple. 
So we can see here, we've got the base, we've got our offset, because we need to find the right in our standard array, the byte. We need to find the offset into there for the right transition, so we hash our state. It's this waving, I'm waving my hands, this possibly minimal perfect hash. Multiply by the stride, wunderbar. Now we can do a, get our address, excellent. And, ooh, dereference sign there, whoopsie, sorry. Um, and then we can reinterpret cast. Although, actually, technically, is it a reinterpret cast or is it a materialization? Uh, well, it's not really a materialization because I call it multiple times. And the first time it should be a materialization, but the rest it shouldn't. Oh dear, I'll just use reinterpret cast because you know what? The compiler's no damn fool. Excellent. I love compiler writers because they know better. So, what I've done here we have, as I mentioned, transition base. It's the base class common to all the transitions. Well, when I say transitions, it's that constrained override typey thing that wraps them. And it's the common base class of those, right? And it shall be supplied by the constrained override type as abstract base type. We've got a hasher. We need to hash the algorithm from the set of states that each transition has a context, remember, which is the state that it is. So if it's new order, it's new order state, and new order state is whatever. It may be char capital A or whatever it is, right? We've got our transitions. This is a set of transitions, a new order transition, a log on transition, a log off transition, a heartbeat transition, a tra la la transition. And they are going to be wrapped. Each one must be wrapped by this constrained override type so I can get at the process method and find the right overload for it. And therefore, I need the right abstract uh, base class which has the right um, abstract method. Because, of course, we'll come to this later. Um, we've got our wrapped transitions. And, yep. That's the wrapped ones, the deplacement nude. So these are the transitions unwrapped. These are the transitions that have been wrapped by the constrained override types that inherits from the abstract base stripes. <laughs> More tea. Mm. <sighs> right. Previous slide, sorry. So we've gone on to unordered tuple, remember? We're delving down into here. We've done an ordered tuple. We're going to look at what this constrained override type is and try and have a few more details, delve into it. Why? Why this madness? It, and remember, it's just syntactic sugar. I could use void star, couldn't I? And then reinterpret cast back. To what type? I don't know. I don't know which transition I'm calling, because I just erased all the time, because I used a computed go-to. Ah, catch 22. You see, if I used if-else, what happens with if-else? The problem does not occur, because we can see with a naive impulse implementation. Here's my state. My state is new order. I call new order transition. I know the type. I know the overload I'm calling, because there it is, and there's the parameters and the types passed. By the way, you know, forwarding, I missed out all the standard forwards in certain places when they're not relevant. There are other places where they are relevant, very, very, very relevant. And I've tried to put those in, but I might have forgotten a few places. Remember, these are, this is schematic. This code will obviously not compile, right? It is extremely unlikely any of these examples will compile. And if they did compile, I apologize sincerely, because I didn't summarize them well enough. And we can see here's our next state order cancel. And we can imagine we've got a return order cancel transition dot process. We know the overloads. We know the types. A posteriori. Here, a priori, I don't know the type because I've worked really hard to erase it, to put it in a bare array of bytes. No type in array of bytes, eh? So we can see we need to do some work to get, recover that type information. We can see we know the exact transition, as I said. A computed go-to implementation, we need an interface class, as I've mentioned, these abstract base types that we generate, a chain of, and inherit cursively from, and then the ultimate base type. So, we've got to provide that process, as I've mentioned. We've got Variable number of parameters, disparate types, etc. Overloading's good in C++. We like it. Works nicely. I mean, that angle bracket's thingy. 
but we don't have support for virtual template member functions. You can't do this. This is the reason why I go to all this effort. This is not supported. For good reason. Why? Uh, the VFT is unbounded at compile time because I could have arbitrary instantiations of that template function in different translation units. So therefore, the VFT changes in size. Ouch. No. Reflection. I spoke quite quickly about why. The why, the purposes. We need to supply a suitable abstract base class for each of the transitions. We need a suitable declaration of a pure virtual process method obtained for each particular transition that may have more than one. Hence, we see signatures, plural, many signatures. Each signature may have arbitrary types in it. Signatures, types. We need also, from those base classes, we've got to, uh, because if I've got a transition, I've got two process methods. I, therefore, I have two abstract base classes I inherit from. One with one process method overload, one with the other process method overload as a pure virtual function. That's what I'm doing here. I need to aggregate those together in a chain of inheritance, bingo, and then put that wrapped thing into the unordered tuple, and you can see, therefore, I've got my transition base class for the unordered tuple. You can see that, OK, I, this is abstract, but I need a wrapper. I need a concrete type, because obviously, those abstract methods are not going to be exactly identical to the process methods in transition itself because of argument forwarding. What exactly are those types? Timo. Question. So you're using a virtual, like a polymorphic, like virtual function table or something like that. How is that different from the help in that in the end the help with the function table? Why is that better or faster or something like that? Uh, Timo asked, uh, I, I'm using these abstract methods. Please, uh, uh, I'm using virtual function dispatch versus eval. Uh, there are great similarities, you're right. Uh, to compare and contrast the differences in quality of implementation, I didn't do it. You will note that this code is somewhat older school, uh, C14-ish. Um, hence, more modern features, despite the fact this code is compiled with C22B, or 23, depending on the compiler. Um, I just didn't look at that in such detail because it was hard enough to write the code. Sorry. It's a, yeah, good point. By the way, I like to have questions throughout the talk. Don't necessarily save them to the end. Interjection is fine. So. Correct. I believe the question was, the reason why we have the transition base is because we don't know, we have an a priori problem, we have no prior knowledge, and therefore what we need to do is somehow generate the ab uh, abstract bases to reconstruct that knowledge. Thank you. You're absolutely correct. Yes, you have it. Good. I'm actually explaining it reasonably. <sighs> I had two reviewers. One reviewer gave six reviews. Paul Evans. Um, we aggregate them in an inheritance chain. Exactly. It's a bit old school, as you said, Timo. Um, I didn't say that. I didn't say anything. <laughs> it is old school. I know you didn't say that, but it no, is old school. But you're right. Uh, you're absolutely correct. If we had, uh, so if, if I'd looked at it more carefully with more modern features, uh, evals and so forth could have assisted. But I'm not sure. I oh, I apologize. You said you're using if else, and then this is too slow, and then you're using virtual function dispatch. Isn't that also just if else? What's the difference? That was my question. Yeah, virtual function dispatch. Ah, oh, sorry. Um, you will actually see that uh, we'll come to the assembly later, and hopefully, we will demonstrate that computed go to was generated. We will also demonstrate that it is not, if else. Okay, that was my question. Ah, apologies, Timo, I misunderstood you, I'm sorry. sorry if I, if I didn't... No, thank you for clarifying, I am imperfect, I am but human. 
So, we've got these wrappers for each transition, and it inherits from all these classes that are generated, and then we can put them into the unordered tuple. Yes, I know this is overly general for what I needed, but, you know, I'm a C++ programmer. Let's generalize it. As I mentioned, C++ doesn't support reflection yet. So that's why we have this signatures types embedded within each transition, so there is intrusiveness of this library. I'm going to generically call these process functions, for some reason, process funds. We're going from particular to template, hence the capitalization. Okay. I've mentioned about these pure virtual methods. I've talked about the abstract base type. What is the base case, the terminal case of our um, recursive unrolling to generate the process functions that are virtual? Notice we're going to be using some forwardy thing going on here, right? And we have. Obviously, we need to do the const and non-const overrides. Boring. No except false. Keep it wide. Equals zero. Jolly good. Now, we need to generate the remaining ones. Because remember, each transition may have two process methods. Mine do, in general, have two process methods, which have different signatures. Therefore, I need to generate the next case. So what I'm going to do is take the return type. I've got my parameters. I've got the list of process functions. You see base class, I pass in a process function. Yes, I have summarized because it should be class process function, class dot 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 process functions for the unroll. It's been summarized to fit on the slide. So the code will not compile. But this is schematic, hence I get out of jail free. So we can see we're unrolling. We've got our base type. What does this provide? This new unroll. It looks at the next set of arguments, parameters. Yes, there should be class param, class dot dot params, right? And we can pass them in. Now we can create the types for our process method. Remember, we couldn't have a template virtual member function. But I can have a virtual member function of a template class where the arguments are specified by the template arguments. Ta-da! Ta-da! Now, after all this chain, I can do this using collect it all together. Bang. Transition space, abstract base type. I've got it. Huzzahs. I know what I'm calling now. But the only problem is I can't instantiate it because it's all pure virtual. So we come to constrained override. What else does constrained override type provide for us? The concrete type. Likewise, before we have the base case, the terminal case. Likewise, this is schematic. It will not compile because I needed to try and fix it, fit it onto a slide. You can see formatting is tricky, yeah, because it gets a bit long. Wide monitors are good. Um, here we have, where's the colon? Notice transition. We inherit from transition. It's an is a relationship. We inherit from abstract base type. Remember, we've collected together all those pure virtual functions for our process methods that transition contains. Now, override. Override. Const, non const. Yes, I've elided the details of the no except because it's ugly and it's not really germane to this. Uh, exposition. We have the return type. We pass the params. Notice we use perfect forwarding to be very careful about our parameter types. Because remember, the parameter types might be a reference. There might be a const reference. So I need to do these tricks to get around it. Notice I call this transition process. Look, we can see now we've got to the transition. So if you imagine back in your mind, uh, unordered tuple, right? We've got transition. We've got the transitions table, angle bracket state that's been hashed, dot process, 
We've seen the pure virtual methods that we can call. Now we've got the overrided types, which actually the instantiation of those pure virtual methods. And now we call the process methods for the actual transition. We've got there finally. We've recovered the type. We can do the overloading. Huzzahs! Of course, it's not an unbounded set of overloading, because remember, you've got to add it to signatures types inside your transition. <laughs> More T vicar. Hmm. Good. Right. Next. Thanks. Yeah, that will finally come. Uh, the question was, is where is the final? And that will come on a few slides, finally. Thank you. Um, so we need to generate all the rest, because that's the base type. And remember, I've got another overload, so I need to generate that as well in my uh, signatures types. There's two of them in there that in this instance. So we have the next case. So we have... We inherit from the base type. Here we go. Abstract base type, you see, that we've carefully created. We've got our transition. We've got our process functions we pass in. Yes, remember, I've, I, I've short-circuited this, and I haven't done this separation here, as you should have done, uh, to make the template recursion work properly. This is schematic. Base type to try and make things a bit shorter in the constructor. We inherit from the constructors. Yes, you see, using, we're inheriting those. We're also inheriting, right? We're make, making sure these process methods are visible as well for the inherited base cases. Very important. And then again, here we have our process methods that we are overriding. So now, ta da! We have our finalizer. Final it. Because, of course, we want to try and get rid of all those virtual methods because, uh, yeah, function calls. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to finalize it and turn it all into a concrete class, finalize it, bang. Okay. Remember the way the abstract base type worked? Is it sort of collected together all the con abstract types? There's the abstract base type, yes. It collected those together to create it abstract base type from the abstract type of rollers. Here, we do a similar sort of thing with the concrete type, but remember, we finalize it to try and say, get rid of all that inheritance, that v all those VFTs. Details will arrive later. How successful was that? So now we can use the final concrete type for each transition inside the unordered tuple to supply the process method that should be called according to the states in a type-safe manner. <laughs> yes, bingo. Yeah, we'll see exactly how well that works later. In principle, we should have removed all the inheritance with the final keyword, using the overrides and the final and so on. Because what's very, very important is that all of these types are fully defined before use. It is utterly vital. Even without the final word keyword, it's utterly vital. Which means, of course, everything goes into a header file. Not very good for compile times. But we've recovered our type information, because we don't care about that, because remember, the goal was simply computer go to or bust. Carry on until you get it. Bang your head against the wall until it works. Good. We can now type safely call. Transition tables, square brackets, operator, index, dot process, we can call that type safely. Yes, we've recovered the type information. Okie dokie. I was talking about these signatures types. What the heck is that? It's this intrusive part because we don't have reflection. And here we have an example. Note, all of them have to return the same type. Remember, this is a state transition table. It's going to return the next state, isn't it? So it's all state type. So. Yeah, we can get away with the same type there. That's OK. Yes, it's a, uh, it's a um, in my opinion, in this use case, it's a minor inconvenience. And now we see a tuple of tuples, which where we've got the first parameter for the first overload, second parameter for the first overload, and so on. Next tuple, first parameter for second overload, and so on. Because remember, we've got those process methods, but no reflection. We, can't, we don't know the argument types. Ouch. So we can't recover them, so you have to tell it. 
Sorry. Yep. And therefore, you've got N entries in here. And there's no way I can compile time check that. So if you make a mistake, woe betide you. Woe betide you. Yes. You be. I be. They be. Be gone. I don't know. Um, okay. Remember that diagram. We've got constraint override types. We've got unordered tuple. That's inside. Meta state machine. Here it is. Here's our machine, right? Here's our state types, the states that come in in each transition. Our machine has a constructor. We'll elide that because it's not particularly germane. It's a bit boring, really. And it is an interesting use of fold expressions. Quite exciting use of fold expressions, actually. Uh, and ha here we have the mythical process method. See? Table state process. Forward the parameters perfectly. Lovely. Lovely. Look at it. It just works nicely, doesn't it? Huzzahs! Here we have the table that we can call, that we've carefully created using our unordered tuples and so forth. How simple is that? You see, the state transitions table combines the unordered tuple and constrained override types. And there is, as I said, if you have your transition and you hash your state and you get the slightly wrong, woe betide you. OK, how exactly do we kind of create this state transition table? Well, obviously, as I said, we need to know the type of the states. Jolly good. We want to wrap the first row. There's a cheat here, and I'm not, and that's for the bar. A very ugly cheat. Shh. We have our abstract base type. We have our perfect hash, which I shall explain later. And we want to get the state of the hash from the transitions and the state value in it. And then we want to wrap a row. And there we have our final type from the constrained override type and the finalizer and blah, blah, blah. And then we want to make the rest of the rows. Yes, this is meta function D tuple make rows. And there's a make row wrapper. The make row wrapper, of course, does all the constrained override type, da la 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 la, for a transition, for the signature type, for the blah, 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 etc. Uh, yes, and I've elided using type name there and so on and so forth because that's boring noise. To repeat, briefly, we've already introduced the abstract base type. You know what that is, sort of. You sort of know what the constraint override type is. We'll talk about the hasher. This thing here, as I said, it's a meta function that extracts the details from signatures types to be used by D tuple make rows that wraps the process functions, the process transition colon colon process, the override. There are many of them, thus process funds, right? And it's fn, not fun, because I don't think there's much fun here unless you really like this sort of code. Um, and then what we get is this. It's just, this is the kind of thing that it does. Yeah, yeah it's really quite ugly. Um, here's an example of it. So we have a lot of rows of a row, and there's a server heartbeat, and it's got its input type, yes? And then we say, just send it to the client, a client heartbeat. And our output will be the output of the static, the, the type of the client heartbeat, its state. Bingo. And there's another row, an execution report. And then we do our execution report response. And another row, match all. Reject it. Easy peasy, isn't it? It all looks nice and easy. OK. I've been kind of glossing over the uh, elephants in the room. The hash. OK. We know a discrete set of states a posteriori because it's just part of a specification that you can download from the web. There, there's where you can download it from if you want. Uh, some people said, a, isn't it a priori? Uh, slightly different. A priori means that you have no prior knowledge. A posteriori means you have prior knowledge. In this case, we specifically have prior knowledge. We have the specification that we can look at and get the details from. This is very, very important. <coughs> If we did not, if it was a priori, this would not work. 
Okay. That means the states, we've got new order, we've got client heartbeat, we've got server heartbeat, we've got uh, uh, execution response. Those states are known. We want to hash them, preferably minimally. Must be perfect. We want as few instructions in that hash function as possible. Remember, we've got to beat 20 clock cycles. Existing hash generations, why don't I use them? Why don't I use GPUF? The problem is, is they're very general. They use a lot more than 20 instructions. Bust. Highly optimized. Mm. Micro-optimizes, yum. Um, so we want to create a generator that's highly optimized. So we've got some kind of executable that's going to generate, instantiate a hash function for us. We can have a minor relaxation. Fortunately, we don't need stability. If imagine, um, imagine new order is uh, state one, and execution response is state 50, and um, client heartbeat is 10,000, right? I don't need this to go 0, 1, 2, 3. It could go 3, 2, 0, 1. That's fine, which makes the constructor quite exciting because it constructs them out of order. When I run by executable, remember I said woe betide you if you get them the wrong way around and they get the wrong hash for the, the wrong uh, resultant hash for the wrong transition. Uh, I do some work in the executable that generates this to try and make sure that doesn't happen. What is the hash function? Uh, I had some, uh, a good chat with uh, Richard Harris, sadly deceased, uh, uh, regarding this. And he said, oh, but why don't you do this? Throw in some XOR. You want to randomize the bits a bit. An XOR basically does a bit of bit shuffling. Moderately, I mean, I know it's predictable because you can do it and so forth, but if you look at it naively, you, and you go, ooh, the bits have shuffled magically. So we can say with a bit of a squint of an eye, add some entropy. <coughs> Denominator. Why do I use a denominator? Percent, ye gods. The most evilest instruction in integer ISA ever. Strength reduction. So what we do is we truncate our inputs. So if we've got, we try and say, if we've got five inputs, well, let's try five as our denominator, because that means we've got a minimal perfect hash, haven't we? because it's going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and let's see if we can get these random numbers that are coming in to map to that. Brute force it. Let's enumerate through all acceptable seeds, yeah, to see if we can find it. And we can constrain the output into a range, because we use the percent operator. So therefore, we can constrain how minimal it should be. Through experimentation, the denominator has to be odd. If you have four inputs, got to add one. Won't find a solution. Uh, I don't know why. I didn't look at the maths. I'm sorry. Turns out, even though the denominator is odd, and you thought, oh, no, that means you've got to do the proper divert percent. Ah! Oh. Actually, strength reduction, I've noticed, always works. Yes. So now for a fixed seed denominator pair, I can instantiate this hash template and write it into a C++ header file. There will be consequences. It's surprisingly slow to enumerate over uh, 2 to the power of 32. Yeah, it takes over about 15 minutes, single thread. But then it's no surprise, it's brute force, isn't it? And you hope you get the first one. So I decided, oh, I've got a parallel library called PPD. Thank you, uh, Hubert Matthews, for uh, the name, Parallel Pixie Dust, uh, where you sprinkle a little parallel pixie dust and magically it all goes faster. Um, I developed this fine first off data parallel algorithm, and that cut the compute time down to about two minutes on this thing here that you can hear whirring away quietly. 
It gets very noisy. Okay. How far? How are we doing? Push on a bit. Um, we may never find a suitable seed. Remember Shannon. There ain't no such thing as a minimal perfect hash with a sufficiently small denominator. So what I do is the seed and denominator, the add entropy, as I said, ain't no such thing. We may need a different algorithm. Remember, if we can't find a solution, no header files written. So you may need a different algorithm. XOR modulo may not work. In all my cases, it, as I said, it revealed that the denominator had to be odd. Also, I had to relax the minimality requirement. I guarantee collision-free. Remember, it's perfect. No collisions. Unordered tuple has zero collision avoidance mechanism. Woe betide you. It's not like unordered map. I found I always got solutions. Took a bit of time, but crunch, got them. Remember I said, if you can't generate the hash, if you can't instantiate it, no header file exists. Therefore, your build will fail. The set of states, as I said, are effectively a set of random numbers, a relatively small set of random numbers. Um, if only they'd use the natural numbers instead and not use random things for states, then all of this would not have been required. So, uh, 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 what's this? Transmission uh, if else to switch. Right, yes, uh, when I mentioned about the naive um, if else implementation, you're thinking, well, why can't the compiler, because compilers are pretty cunning with if else uh, uh, chains and with switch statements. And what can happen is that um, with a, if the compiler can work stuff out, what it'll do is it'll go generate something rather cunning and use bisection searches and cluster uh, entries in the if or case state labels and so forth. Um, but the problem is, is because the compiler doesn't know the MIT specification because it doesn't connect to the web, yeah, fair enough. Poor GCC lads have got enough on their plate and clang lads and so forth. Um, it doesn't generate it. So the compiler avoids the ain't there, there ain't no such thing as a general, minimal, perfect hash using a dividing bisection with divide and conquer algorithm. Uh, I've had a look at this before in previous slides. Uh, GCC is quite interesting there in Clang and how they do it. There's uh, quite a bit of research in that area. Um, okay, let's test this. What is my methodology of testing? I've got this cut down version of fixed emit. In this instance, it's Borsitalia. Why Borsitalia? B comes before L. Metastate machine. I've got all the value of states. I've got the number of transitions. I simplify it. Then what we're going to do is we're going to compare the performance to if -else, a naive if-else implementation. I'm going to randomize my selection of input states using a Merzen twister, because I can. Uh, unless otherwise noted, as I said, I use G++ 12.2.1 uh, and clang, blah. It's very heavily templated, the translator, because it's reasonably fast. Um, it listens to a socket on the client side for fixed messages, and then on the server side, sends those mits to bit format messages. They're basically uh, um, structs, so you know the layout in advance. Uh, I had two tests. One is in order, so I send a new order message, I receive a response. I send another new order message, I receive a response. I have out of order. I send all the new order messages, 10,000 of them. I wait for 10,000 responses. I repeat this a lot. I used Boost ASIO, but I also used SSC2 and higher instructions. Went a bit mad there. No, I did not use solar flare cards nor open on load. I've got previous presentations, I've got more details of how these, this uh, test works. <coughs> yeah, we've covered this, new order socket, blah, blah, we basic simulator, responds with a fill, translates it back, et cetera. Covered that, sent it back to the client, yup, 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 spoken about that. Uh, yeah, my computer was quiescent, I did not use new control, because it has one processor. Many cores, one processor. Uh, I highly optimized my kernel, 
I'm a Gen 2 Linux user. Um, that lap brick, it's a bit old. The Ryzen 9 3900 is a few years old now, but it's fairly grunt worthy, um, pretty fast, and I've got a fairly fast NVMe drive. I made sure it was quiescent as well. I was trying not to use my laptop at the time. Uh, I was asleep. Here's some results. Microbenchmark number one. Okay, I have not gone into the translator yet. I've gone simplified first. What we're going to do is have a micro benchmark in which we just look at the meta state machine itself without all the translatory bits around. And what we do is we see there's a line here that's slightly hidden. Bang, bang. There's a few outliers here. See? Going up to 1.1, well, 11 microseconds. We can see quite clearly at 20 nanoseconds, 30 nanoseconds, and 40 nanoseconds, we've got binning. That's about 10 nanoseconds apart. That's about half the pipeline. We compare FLs using computer go to. There's no difference. I mean, come on, I can't see a difference there. What happens is the branch prediction never gets flooded. Because why? Although I'm choosing the messages randomly, there's four of them. Uh, that's four different branches. That's well inside my 32 BTB branch target. Buffer caches. So it's going to work beautifully. The branch predictor is sweet as a nut for this. That's why we don't see any performance difference. Inadequate branches. Okay, what about Clang? Hmm, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. 40 nanoseconds, 30 nanoseconds, 20 nanoseconds, uh, 20 nanoseconds, 30 nanoseconds, 40 nanoseconds. Clang generates faster code. Yeah, there's something weird going on with GCC here in its generation of simple if else chains. What the heck's going on? Again, uh, I'm sorry, I can't see a performance difference there. Pipeline hazards, perhaps. Uh, I attempted to generate, oh yes, I did I manage, oh yes, I did, oh, jolly good, yes, 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 excellent. Uh, here we go. Here is the if else chain, G++ generated code. And we can see the call to unroll here. It's not unroll, it's if else. I put unroll in my terminologies as if else. Um, and we can see there's a compare, there's a jump. To 997, there's a compare, there's a jump, there's a call, and we can see these all look a bit out of order because look, that's two, then three, four, four, one, three. Remember, I told you about that um, uh, bisection search? There it is happening. To try and reduce the number of ifs. So, although I've got four, it, on average, I only actually hit two, so therefore my pipeline is running sweet as a nut with this. Whereas, there's the computer to go to. Oh no, uh, that's all, uh, what's happening is code merge. Global code motion. But what we can see is we can see right at the top, we've got our hash there, right at the top. And then we come down and a state gets loaded. It's a nice immediate, lovely, no decache hit, no 10 clock cycle stall, lovely, lovely, lovely. Well, oh dear. Uh, well, we didn't see those. It's not relevant. Uh, then we've got some more code, an IMAL. There's a shift right. We can see some kind of strength reduction occurring. We've got an uh, LEA. This is a target address computation for the wrappers. This looks something like the V tables is happening here. So that final, Martin, didn't really work, sadly. Then we've seen, here we are. That's the denominator, OX5. An immediate, lovely, no decash hit. We can see there's strength reduction here. Excellent. Yet more address computation. And then finally, we've got the call. We made a computed go to. We have achieved. We're on the top of the mountain and we see the view. What is our view? Okay. It generated the expected computed go to's. This is great. It's very disappointing that there's so many assembly instructions. A lot of hard work. 
Global code motion and inlining makes deciphering it incredibly hard. Yeah, yeah, I mentioned about the AGIs, the LEA, and the evil AGI. And I think that's what's occurring here, is inadequate devirtualization. We wanted it less than 20 clock cycles. I don't know, what, one, two, three, four, five, blah, 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 blah. That looks about 20 ish instructions. Bad. Getting that assembly is fairly tricky. Godbolt, I couldn't use it because I didn't want to hurt poor Matt too hard. Uh, quarter of a million line translation units. Cut and paste. I think it's a bit cheeky, really, isn't it? So I used Objump. And Objump's really good when it works, and a law and a very strong cup of tea. But when it doesn't, all it does is report you've got a 60, x86 64 bit L format file. Some of these I couldn't get the Objumps for. OK, now we're going to go back to the good old full fat mid to bit translator using GCC. Let's throw it all in there, take, ignore the micro benchmark. Let's look at this. Here's our histogram. Notice total numbers up here. 25 million. Mean average deviation less than 5%. It was very hard to stabilize. Mean average deviation is similar to standard deviation, but they run very roughly the one over root n plus 1 is dropped out, so it's much more sensitive to outliers. Uh, so it's a much stricter measure, and also because it doesn't require standard deviations, it doesn't need a normal distribution. Why? Because latencies are relative, are rarely negative. They're more likely to be a Poisson distribution. That's my hand-waving justification. Looking at the kurtosis is crucial in any of these things, because what we've got here is, look, Slightly faster here, the computed go to. We can see our outliers at 50 microseconds. Take bad. Of course, which ones are the outliers? It's very small. Well, yeah, you just get a call from production saying, why do I want to take 50 microseconds rather than 10 microseconds? I don't know, I don't care. Um, it just works. You're lucky your order got in. Uh, we've got quite a bit of extra performance here. So it's put, with a big squint, it might be that computed go to is faster. But that's a real squint. OK, how did Clang do? Oh, sorry, this is out of order, is it? Is this, is this Clang? GCC, still GCC. And this is the out of order rather than in order. And we can see there's actually here quite a big difference. Look. This is why looking at the histograms is vital. There's our statistics, yeah? The mean, the mean is, well, that's within the standard deviation. There's no statistical difference in performance from the simple mean and standard deviation measure. But if we look at the histogram, that's a big difference. If else, bad. Computed go to, better. If else, computed go to. Is it really faster? I don't know. There's a hint there. How did Clang do for in order? Notice the difference in the graphs. We've got resonances here occurring, we might term it as. But we can also see that, look, there's the if-else, there's the computer go-to. There's the computer go-to. There's if-else versus computer go-to. Which one is faster? There's our statistics. The standard deviation, evil standard deviation. Uh, I managed to get better mean average deviation on this. So I managed to get slightly better statistics. Still 20 million. Yeah. Remember, that's the peak of these. So there's a lot more orders. Yeah. Some each box. Many, many hours of that going were. Energy was consumed. These resonances at 750 nanoseconds are quite curious. Uh, I didn't have time to research them and try and find out exactly what's going on. But remember, my primary goal was to generate a computed go-to. Out of order. Again, in general, we've got a kind of performance improvement here, but we've got a big 
It beats it there a lot, if else versus computer go to. Whereas computer go to beats it here. Again, yeah. But the point is, is there's significantly different code generation occurring in the assembly. Uh, to go and compare and contrast the assembly, put the diffs on the slides. Too big, too boring. Very small improvements. We've hit the noise floor. Remember that was one of our goals, to hit the noise floor? We cannot, any further changes have not improved the performance. That is one of, was one of our goals in this experiment. But the generated assembly looks very suspicious. Yeah, maybe it outperforms, if else, from the histograms, but yeah, I'd be worried. Uh, I'm also going to somehow, somewhat claim that those um, SSE instructions, remember that's a laptop, remember the, power, the um, fans are whirring, thermal dissipation. Yes, the compiler scheduled independent instructions avoiding hardware hazards, but there is also another hazard these days on these things, thermal dissipation. If I'm using the AVX unit, yeah, that's a lot of transistors that are dumping heat into this poor little fan. Shh. Processor gets underclocked. Very hard to stop. C states won't help you. Why? Because the process is trying to stop smoke coming out. Somebody had smoke come out of their laptop, I think. Yes, and we really don't want that, do we? Um, again, one of the problems in these tests, I believe, is that they were actually highly predictable. There were only four states, five states. This is well within the branch target buffer and so forth. So in fact, although I randomized those states, who cares? Really not a lot of difference. It's in fact surprising that I got as well as I did, despite the fact that the uh, code generation, shall we say for GCC, was a bit dodge. Uh, by the way, the reason why you don't see the Clang assembly is because Clang generates uh, Clang LLVM IR, and when you do a uh, Clang objdump, LLVM objdump, it says that the uh, file that was generated is not in Clang format. Catch 22. The tooling, shall we say, needs investigation. The chief point is, is that there are very clever people at Intel, AMD, who work very hard at branch predictors. In fact, I happen to know some chaps who work very hard at branch predictors, uh, Professor Colin uh, Egan, sorry, Dr. Colin Egan, and uh, Professor Gordon Stephen. Professor Gordon Stephen is vaguely notable for his um, uh, creation of the uh, VLIW system that was used in the Itanic, and then later on in more modern um, VLIW, uh, 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 units in modern processors. What's a VLIW in modern par unit in modern parlance? It's the SSC MMX AVX units. And these chaps were really quite bright in their old branch predictions, uh, predictors. And they, uh, I believe, uh, the uh, modern branch predictors also use neural nets in them, uh, which are very highly overclocked, to essentially do statistical determination using Markov chains. And that's why they're so accurate. <sighs> yes, it also means a large amount of silicon is used, and they get very hot. So, one could see that, yes, and that is a, a, a nice way of putting it. The gentleman said, um, one might infer from the histograms that the computed go-to looks more stable. Uh, that is possible, and that is an interpretation I have also made of them, uh, so you're not alone. And, but I would still question and argue, uh, we need more evidence to prove this. Um, also, tooling issues, obj dump, generating the disassembly. I'd really like to see the disassembly for the clang, please. You know, remember, in the simplified metastate example that I had, clang was significantly faster. So it's, therefore, its code generation must be significantly faster. It must have had less code, fewer instructions. Why? I'd like to see it. Stop it. Or somebody tell me how to use it properly. Yes, I did try using EU Obstump. Uh, the message I got from that was extremely helpful. It said uh, that you have an x 64 format binary file. Yeah, no, no shit, Sherlock. A file could have told me that in more details as well. Uh, 
I don't think this is a contentious statement, that the complexity of the code is outrageous. Let me emphasize with my special super long pointy stick, right? It is outrageous. Do you want to do this? Maintainability is lost. You need a compiler that supports C++ very well. Compilers do crash in this, and Clang for many years would uh, attempt to compile my library and say, and generate an, uh, a, the static file, because of course dynamic linking. <gasps> no, it's all static. Yes, 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 and jolly good. Um, problem. Clang generates the static file, and then it says I can't read it in valid format. So I couldn't use Clang for a few years. Bizarrely, I was talking about compile times. The compile time wasn't actually significantly increased. Remember I said it's basically an n-squared algorithm I've just introduced. But fortunately, n was fairly small. It was about five with about two in overloads. So that's not a lot. Uh, what's happened is the rest of the template metaprogramming I've got has swamped the compile time increase of that. Yes, I do, temp I, I do use template metaprogramming to generate assembly. I mean, specializations, built-in pop counts, specializations. Uh, AVX instructions. Well, the built-ins for AVX instructions and so forth. Uh, they probably gobbled it. I have a less powerful computer at home, a much less powerful computer at home. It's about eight years old and it takes about 10 hours to compile this code. To run the entire test suite takes a week. Not exactly practical, shall we say? Um, 10 gigs of RAM to compile the translation unit. Yeah, oh, I'll do minus J, 50. Yeah, I've got 24 cores. Uh, Oom killer comes along. Why do you think I've got a very fast NVMe drive in there? So paging doesn't hurt as bad before the Oom killer hits. And then I realized, yes, I've got 64 gigs in there. I'll just run minus J3, despite the fact I've got 12 cores. It limits the parallelization of the build. And the CMake scripts obviously become much more complex. But what's also an interesting feature is, is remember that I have to wait until I've generated the hash. My entire build has a fork, parallelize, join, generate the hash. Wait a while. Now we can start compiling again. Bleeding egg. The XOR modulo hash algorithm. This jolly algorithm. As I mentioned, it serializes the build. You've got to parallelize it, otherwise it's really slow. And you need a nice parallelization library. Fortunately, I had one of those, but it did take a month to fix all the bugs. Um, because, of course, you always presume it works, and then you add something new, and then you finally find more bugs. And then you realize that, oh, oh, for the past four years, I've been ignoring those bugs, those test cases that failed, because it takes a week to run all the test cases, so you don't, or you pretend it works, or you stick your head in the sand, because you're far too busy trying to think how to fix those angle bracket overloads, because the compiler error story is giving you a real brain strain. You know, cut, paste into text document, wait for five minutes for it to load the error message, and then delete a lot, wait a few more minutes, and then do some search and replace, wait a few more minutes, and now you're down to about 10K. <laughs> Should you ever rely on luck to compile your code? Remember the hash? There ain't no such thing as a minimal perfect hash. I got lucky. With all the examples I've done, it worked. The problem is, is I've replaced the algorithm for the perfect minimal hash with a more sophisticated algorithm. I've got to beat 20 clock cycles. And remember that those damn fine developers and researchers at Intel, AMD, et cetera, ARM, and so on and so forth, they're working really hard as well. And there's more of them than me. I am going to lose the arms race. You might have said, what about standard hash? Overly general again, too many instructions. Psi hash, it's a brilliant hash. It's very fast. 
far too many instructions. I mean, there's nearly 50. <gasps> murmur two and murmur three. Again, same problem. They are more general. I need a more specialized function. I'm going to speculate that if I added a few more states, and I reckon, I reckon if I got to about 10, it's going to fail. Currently, I've got less than or equal to seven. But as I said, I reckon I'm pushing my luck. You could nest metastate machines. And then you have a hash for the hash. <laughs> nope. Yeah, one could view it as this, as a conclusion. I have generated and spent some time generating this to get a computed go-to, because that was the point. Remember? The problem state was to generate a computed go-to, not to generate one that's faster than if else. Clear and careful reading, please. Yes, we could claim exorbitant effort was taken to, in terms of speed up, yes, suspicious assembly generation may have hindered that. But that was not the point of my experiment. Ha, 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 clear and careful reading. I managed to force the compiler to generate the computed go-to with C++. One might claim it took heroic effort to recover this type information, where I very, very worked very hard to erase it. I managed to recover it. Madness. I even had to invent a data parallel algorithm to make it generate the hash in what might claim is less unreasonable time. But we do have, in the end, a pretty high performance better state machine implemented as a library. I mean, it's up there with the best, the Intel, AMD, etc. I claim. The results seem to indicate, can do. Of course, the choice of micro optimization investigated is vital, remember. I chose to look at the meta state machine, how it's implemented. But premature optimization is, of course, the root of all evil. <laughs> Perhaps these techniques may serve as a warning to the rest of you so tempted in the excitements and deliciousness of micro-optimization. I did it so you would not have to. I present this so it has been done before, so you may demonstrate to others that you can not use your life in this area. My sincere thanks to John Chesterfield. He's listened to me talk about this since 2017. Now, I'm given to understand it's 2023 at the moment, which would imply that that was six years. But, of course, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. It's not actually six years, it's only five. Because when I looked at the dates of the communications with him, it dated to uh, November 2017, so we'll call it 2018, and therefore it's only five years, not six years. It didn't take six years of effort. I'm not that dumb. It took five years of effort. I'm a genius, allegedly. Uh, also, thanks to my reviews, Paul Evans and Vladimir Arnosh, they put in a lot of effort reviewing this and getting through the earlier versions of the talk. If you want more information on the methodology, please ask. We may seem like we're at the end, but there's this curious epilogue here. What is that? A lot of effort, five years' effort, for potentially zero performance improvement. But we did achieve computed go-to. We did achieve a library that would do this for us. We did achieve a generic library that would do this for us. But ultimately, the end result, remember, I am a micro-optimizer. I'd like to see it faster. One of the, in my opinion, one of the greatest successes of micro-optimization ever by these two gentlemen. They used Euclidean affine functions and their application to calendar algorithms. They basically optimized the conversions between Gregorian calendars and Unix epoch-based 
offsets by a very, very cunning use of underflow <coughs> and very careful selection of instructions where they also you look micro optimized not only for performance but also heat. They have a significantly faster version, which uses significantly less power because of the strength reduction they use in selection of instructions. And this has been committed to Linux kernel. I, went, I believe it went in into 5.15. It's now in libc. It's in chrono. It's in Microsoft.net, which includes C sharp. Now, chrono, standard library. Yes. GCC and Clang. Yes. Literally billions of installations. It is the most successful micro-optimization I have ever heard of. Remember, choose your micro-optimization wisely. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>